Okay, Vine's association with St. Columbus College has now extended over almost 60 years since he came to the college as a master in 1935. Since that time, he was housemaster, librarian, subwarden, fellow, and most recently, the historian of the college. Mr. White, what are your first memories of the college when you came in 1935? It was very small. I suppose the first impression it had gone up to 90 boys by the time I arrived. And the staff was very small, about half a dozen of us. They were all but one were bachelors because it was virtually impossible to live as a married man on what we were paid at that time. George Lodge was the only married man, and how he did it, nobody never ever knew. He was not well off. My other memory, I think, is it was rather an undisciplined place. There were uh, there was a good deal of bullying by older boys and younger boys, which was just being got rid of. And I found them <coughs> uh, obstreperous in class, which uh, was new to me because I had been teaching for three years in a school in Ceylon, where they were very good. And I'd, it was quite a surprise to me to find uh, uh, boys making difficulty over discipline. And, and what, what uh, sanctions did you have? How could you, did, were they always beaten if they were um, uh, unruly or? Well, not like me. And, because uh, in, in my time, even at the worst, uh, only housemasters gained. I may have reported some, but I can't remember. The other thing I remember is that there was a great atmosphere of growth. Uh, I sometimes feel like uh, Wordsworth, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. Things were improving the whole time. Buildings were going up, and uh, and the place was becoming more civilized. Where, where, where do they all live? that time, the boys, and, and where was the teaching done? Because really, I suppose the college would have ended at the, the Beach Arch virtually, would it, at that time? They, um, it ended really before that. They, um, the, the dormitories, they call them all sorts of names now, but they were the top dormitory over the dining hall, and the middle and lower dormitories were I always knew them as, and the Cadogan, and they were all in those. Yes. And the staff? I tell you another thing. The garden house, I don't know, is it still called the garden house? It is house? indeed, yes. Well, there's a large room there, now a dormitory. It was divided in two by a sort of partition. This is the room upstairs? Yes. yes. And I slept in one of those divisions, and a young man called Robert Barnes slept in the other. And for my first term, I don't think I even had a cupboard. I lived out of a suitcase. And um, my second year, 
starting in September, <coughs> I had a partial use of a sitting room up there. And then when you became a housemaster in 1937, did that mean a much difference in your comforts or your oh, lifestyle? Yes. Well, it actually, it actually come before. Because what the founder's building was completed in the summer of 1936. And Peter Morris, a dear friend of mine, and I moved in as the first documents in the top story. We had uh, pleasant rooms there. That, that was the beginning of civilization. For me. And your your house was Grange House. Grange. And yes. where were where where were your boys based? In in They were in the <coughs> in the middle and lower dormitories. Uh, so you, how many house. houses were there then? There was There was uh, when I for nineteen thirty seven when I uh, started being housemaster. Uh, there was Grange and Glen, and there was a junior house started in the top dormitory under Peter Morris. Well, what was the junior house? As Archer Braddon House now? They, they were not so young. They were like boys coming 13 for their first year, about. Why, why was this junior house established? Was it to protect the I don't know. I don't know. Well, what, what, what were your memories of your first years as a housemaster, the problems you had to deal with? Did you find it fulfilling and enjoyable? I, I always enjoyed that from the beginning. Uh, I always enjoyed being a housemaster from the beginning. And um, a couple of years ago, Two contemporaries um, who were in my house that time. One, an American boy, John Packard, who was still a friend of mine, and the other friend of his, called Mervyn Bentley, <coughs> were wandering around the college together, these three old men. And we met some girls who smiled at us very nicely. These were pupils. What? Girl pupils. Girl pupils. Yes. And uh, I said to them, <coughs> I'm showing these two round the, the haunts of their youth when I was their housemaster. And the girl looked at me as if I had seven heads, you know, <laughs> because they weren't very young, and I was even less <laughs> You talked about um, your association with, with Peter Morris. The person, I suppose, in the minds of many Columbians with whom you've been most associated was um, Dr. Willis. Yes. Um, and you quoted in your book the last words, I think, uh, what somebody said, Willis and White are always oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. That's what they said. Uh, mocking the, the uh, we were very close allies for 30 years Shannon uh, Willis and I uh, from the start really he uh, dominated the common room and um, it was the we lived a good deal in the common room in those days. Um, there was a billiard table in it. But um, he was very much the master of everything. Yes. The, well, one thing that would probably, we would find, now find strange was the almost complete absence of women in the college, not just as pupils, but at every level. 
Now you continued on as a housemaster of Grange until your marriage, I think. Yeah. Grange. What, what did you think of this? Um, and did did you in re do you in retrospect regret the absence of women at the college? Well, I'm sorry, John, but it didn't surprise me at the time because I'd been used myself at school to a total absence of women. I did, if, where I was in Salon, we had women on staff and we were perfectly happy. But it didn't surprise me to feel, feel any absence. Mm. The, I suppose for a number of people, the portrayal of those early years, well, perhaps particularly the 40s, um, of the college would have been through Michael Campbell's book, Lord Dismiss Us. Would, what, what did you feel when you read that? I mean, you were one of the characters in it. I got off rather lightly. He, he had a really photographic memory. They, it was quite extraordinary. But what I can never forgive him for was his portrayal uh, his portrayal of uh, Peter Ault, uh, who was the uh, main character in that. And um, <coughs> he represented him photographically accurately. And um, as having um, killed himself, in a sort of homosexual um, despair. Now, Peter Hall's mother was alive still then, and I never forgave him for that at all. That's what I really, I find quite shocking. They were, he and uh, uh, Michael Campbell were quite good friends, and uh, I was very fond of Peter Ault. He was an impossible person, but uh, whatever his, uh, his sexual orientation was, uh, he was uh, respectable, shall we say. You know? Yes. See? And uh, a, a, a very deeply religious man. And he quite certainly did not kill himself, you see. Yes. That I can swear to. Mm. But you would agree that it's, um, you talked about Campbell's photographic memory. It does capture perhaps some of the spirit of the, of the school as it was at that time. In a, in a curious caricature way. Yes. I mean, it is a caricature. Mm. You see, but uh, so devilishly clever that it's uh, you couldn't fault it over details, mm. you know. But uh, but they were they were all wrong, you know. Yes. You see, and um, he was a cruel chap, Michael Campbell, verbally. A pleasant boy. I, I liked him well as a boy. But, uh, but uh, and clever chap, of course. But uh, well, if we could move on to perhaps the the second phase of your teaching career in the in the college when um, Martin Argyle became warden, what what did he bring to the office of warden? and particularly as, as a colleague whom you later served as a sub warden. Well, I think I've been trying to write about him recently. I think above all, we found him transparently honest and reliable. And um, Not an original man, but so solid, so trustworthy, 
that you could forgive him everything. That's really what I feel about him. And I, I have uh, said this, what I've been writing, that um, his long wardenship is, might be remembered for many things, but it ought to be remembered as the first time in the history of the college when for so long there had been stable peace. And that was his work, I believe. What, what, what work, what, could you give us some of the details of the type of work he did to ensure this, this peace, this 25 years? Well, he never went in for dramas. That's one thing. No scenes. No scenes. And um, uh, very early on, there was what might have been the most unpleasant scandal. Nothing to do with boys in the school. And um, he dealt with it so quickly. About half a dozen of us knew that it had happened at all. It involved, I may say, the birth of a dead child. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, he dealt with everybody. So quietly, so efficiently. Uh, it's awfully hard to say it's what he was not that really mattered. I only once knew him lose his head. And um, uh, was it something? Awful that made him do it. I mean, I think so. Yeah. But uh, but he got excited. Yes. It's, but that in twenty, well, I was with him for twenty-four years. That is remarkable. I can only think of one occasion when yes. he lost his head. He was also the last warden so far uh, of the college. Uh, to be a, a priest uh, yeah. uh, in holy yeah. orders. And yeah. how, how much was that part of his wardenship? Well, it, it's difficult to, to say this without uh, giving a wrong impression of him. But it really had nothing to do with it at all, you see. The, the, he was a religious man, undoubtedly, but in a very simple way. And um, he behaved, I think, generally speaking, like a, a layman who believed in the church, and believed in, in the Christian religion. Um, we never thought it wouldn't be felt like a, a, a priest at all. Mm. Uh, he was, of course, the last appointed under the, uh, the old statute, the original yes. statute. Uh, they'd made a, a silly compromise uh, in the 40s. Uh, over that, um, which was that uh, if no suitable clerical applicant appeared, then a layman could be appointed, which really meant nothing, you see. Yes. And uh, they, I always thought of his appointment as a miracle because. Uh, with all due respect to the people who were involved, one of whom is a friend of mine and alive still, but they took 
only six weeks, I think, from the time that Sobe uh, announced his retirement to the time that Martin Argyle was appointed. How, how did they advertise? As, I as don't know. So uh, do, have you any idea if the field was strong or what sort of a field there was? I know one other man who applied and I was very glad he wasn't appointed. <laughs> I won't say who it was. But uh, I don't know anything about the field. But I do remember that it was very quick. Certainly not more than six weeks. And I remember uh, some time later that uh, he was talking about another school's appointment for headmaster, which is one that I was involved in, and I think rather badly treated uh, in Dublin School. And Martin said to me, this is very different from the way that the trouble they took over me. And I said, look here, Warden, that's all very well, but I should continue to regard your appointment as a miracle. How, how did you think he, as an Englishman, coped with being warden of an Irish school, particularly in, you know, in, the, in the years that were in it? He was totally English. And uh, I, I don't, I think he was so English that he did not realize there was any difference. You see, <laughs> in that respect, I may say, he was a marked contrast with his successor, who was always deeply conscious of being English. And uh, well self-conscious about it, you see. Martin Argyle never was. Never was, no. 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 He didn't. Uh, so he never, he never, in a sense, felt, he never, as some English people would, he never condescended to no. the Irish or. He just no. thought we were the same. Just sort of the same, I think. Yes. Uh, and um, I think the only way I saw it as affecting him was that um, there were certain, a few, uh, certain boys, uh, one in particular I think of, who was a very, very, very vulgar boy. Martin was totally unaware of this because he just thought of his Irish, <laughs> you see. If he, he was being an English vulgar boy, he'd have known, but he, he thought, this was just Irish. Uh, but it was because he treated everybody the same like that, that he was one of the reasons why we trusted him. Do, do you think he intended to stay as long as he did as a warden of the college? Or could one say? I don't know. I do know that one school in England uh, did uh, ask him, uh, would these three retiring headmaster, who I knew, was anxious for him to come there. And he thought of it and decided to know. But it was part of his not thinking about himself at all that he went on not seeing himself in that time at all. You see? Yes. I think, I think it would be fair to say um, that he stayed longer than he should have, you see. But, um, I, but uh, he was not at the end of his time as Nothing like the energy that he had at the beginning, you see. Also, during those years, the Argyle years, 
you, you talked about the way the common room was when you came first, very much dominated by Dr. Willis, very much a male bastion. What, what, what changes of that kind among the staff took place, either in personnel or in atmosphere, during those years under our guard? Well, they started before him. Uh, there was a very wonderful man, Machine Kelly, <coughs> on the staff. And uh, I didn't know anything about the staff when I went there first. It was a very large proportion of Englishmen. And um, they were not there for very long. And uh, then they'd go away. It was really the, in the 40s, before Serbia went, uh, we started getting married masters. And there was... And where did these married masters, did they, did they live out, of, outside oh, yes. the college? And did their wives ever have, play any role in the functions or um, activities of the college? Well, um, Dorothy Brooks, uh, that's Sean Brooks's wife, did a bit. But uh, Oshin's wife did not. She had seven children, and that occupied her <laughs> fairly well. And they lived in Tempelo. And she, she would come to things, but that's all. <laughs> and what about yourself? Your, I mean, your own life must have changed, not only personally, but professionally, when you got married, because mm -hmm. you gave up being a housemaster. I gave up being a housemaster for two years. Only two? <clears throat> only two. And then the warden asked me if I would... Uh, he wanted to start a new house. And... Uh, this was Gwyn House? Gwyn, yes. which I named. And um, uh, he. Um, why, why did he want to start a new house? Was this because of the oh, increasing numbers? The increasing numbers. And um, uh, that was an odd, that was an odd exper experiment. You, uh, you were living where then? I actually, for the first year, from 52 to 53, I was living in. Um, uh, down in Rath Mines, and uh, I had a house tutor. I, he, I haven't heard him for years, but I, he cured me of wanting to have a house tutor. And uh, he, uh, but um, it wasn't a very satisfactory arrangement. Well, what, who did what when you had this house tutor as you were, when you were house master? Well, he. Did things that I hadn't. I remember one occasion when a boy came to me to ask permission to go out somewhere, and I refused it. But he went to the house too and got it. You see, but that annoyed me. Well, and then uh, in '53, uh, Warden decided to make. Uh, Restore as a resident what was then the sanatorium, which is the house that McMullen is living in now. Deerport House. Deerport House. And uh, offered it to me to live in, and uh, we lived there for 20 years, you see. Did you like living in it? I loved it. Yes. I loved it. I loved it so much. That it's the only part of the college that I can't go back to see now. See? Yes. I mean, the McMullins very kindly said, Come, and I said, Look, I'm sorry, but I can't. You see? One of your other duties at that time, well, really since uh, 19, whatever, the library. Yes. Um, you, you, you mentioned to me earlier how much you loved um, being librarian. What was the library like when you came there? This was the Masterman Library. It was unquite catalogued. It had been... The dear man who was in charge of it, 
uh, is now dead, and I was very fond of him. But um, it, there was no catalogue, and it was in great disorder, and it was also a good deal smaller than it became in my time, in a number of books. Yes. And um, I took it on um, in 37 and uh, um, got rid of some books and bought more and uh, made a catalogue and it was uh, and uh, the furniture as it is there in the master library is it was entirely in my time made my time. What, what was there before? There were some very ugly uh, wooden, black painted wooden shelves and uh, those uh, oak bookcases uh, I got made by a German called uh, Pat Home and the chairs the chairs were made by the celebrated uh, Dublin, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, furniture maker. What furniture maker you call it? Uh, Jimmy Higgs, oh, yes. the younger, mm. the son of the great Jimmy Higgs. And he was a great friend of mine. And what, what did boys read then? What did they like reading? They read a great deal more than they did at the end of my time. You could see you could see that even in your time yes. as the change. Yeah, that I sometimes think that is the only really big difference I saw in the boys at the beginning of my time and at the end. And and what caused it in your view? Because we, we tend to think now it's because the school is fully co-educational and they want to spend time chatting with the girls and chatting with each other. No. But that wasn't true no. in your time, so what? No. I don't know. Uh, there was... Uh, was it the advent of television? Did they watch television? Well, there was... Television came... The first television set was put in about 1970, very short before the end of my time. Mm. I don't know, but I do know that for most of my time as librarian, there was a great deal of reading of novels and other books for pleasure. At the end of my time, the books were read to learn something, you see. Mm. And an extraordinary few boys read for pleasure. I don't know what to say like now, but, uh, but there were very few, very few were reading for pleasure. And uh, I used to have the library open for borrowing books between breakfast and chapel on Sundays. And uh, At one time, I couldn't keep pace with them. My library assistant, uh, prepaid, and I were hard at work the whole time. At the end of my time, get an odd one coming in, that's yes. all. We, you mentioned Sundays. What, what um, were the weekends like in your time as, as a, a schoolmaster at St. Columbus? What did, what did they, the boys do on a Saturday evening? What did they do on Sunday evenings if there wasn't a chapel? Or was there always chapel? Well, when I first went there, there was always chapel. When I first went there, there were always the two main services of the day. And that got reduced uh, to... Um, I think we always had to... The, Matins, but uh, uh, but uh, 
the evening service. It might have been a ball she ran. I can't remember. But it certainly wasn't a compulsory evening service. So, so what did they, how did the boys amuse themselves or entertain themselves on Saturdays and Sundays? When, during the weekends? Because I suppose fewer of them went out than go out now. Much fewer. They were, there were just so many Sundays in the term, they were allowed out. You see, that's all. Why was that? Never thought it would be any different, you see. But uh, uh, we'd better not start beyond that because it's a uh, danger for people at <coughs> my age thinking that things have gone to, to the bad. Well, what, what did they do then? How, how did they occupy themselves? Well, they played tennis and they played games by the place, and then they went for bicycle rides and walks, and uh, with very few exceptions, they were fully occupied. That's all I can say. And there wasn't much indiscipline when, when they had all this free time? Not an awful lot that I discovered, but I'm Sure, there was some. In 1964, when Dr. Willis uh, left the college, retired, you became his successor as sub-warden. What difference did that make in your life? Really awfully little. Um, I do, I think I, can say this because he would have he said it often himself. Martin Argyle several times said to me that he always regarded his rule as a triumvirate of himself and Sandman Willis and me. And that's, I think, I don't know whether he was justified in saying that, but that was his repeated assertion that he regarded it as a triumvirate. And to, I had been with Willis so much in the warden's confidence for so many years that it made awfully little difference in becoming sub-warden. It made a difference to me that Sandham Willis was not there. You missed him a lot. I missed him a great deal. He was stayed on for two years, you know, and as uh, just teaching mathematics and living in the garden cottage and uh, completely obliterating himself apart from his teaching. And then he, then he went completely in 67, I think. Uh, 66. Uh, but uh, uh, it really made all the little difference. Yes. For that reason. I mean, I had been working so closely with the warden for so many years. He would consult Willis and me about all sorts of things. We just went on with yes. Willis. But the next year then, in, in 1965, you became a fellow of the yes. college. And between 1965 and your retirement in 1973, you were both a staff member and a fellow of the college, and there, and there has been none since. What was that like? Well, I was trying to prepare myself to answer this. You see, when I became a fellow, Willis was a fellow too. He had been a fellow since 53 or 5, about then. 
and um, uh, I just joined him on that. And then after a, a year, about after he finally retired, he re resigned his fellowship. To me, when I was much to my pride and joy, uh, the lecture fellow, the chief thing, oh God, uh, the chief advantage to me was the knowledge that after I retired, I would still be able to be of some use to the place to live. Do, do you think that the the practice, if you, if you can call it that, uh, during your time as a fellow on Dr. Willis's, of having a serving member of staff on the fellows was a good one, or had had it disadvantages either for you or indeed for the fellows? Well, I I don't know. You have to ask the fellows about that. I don't think they did. To me, it seemed quite natural. You see, I had been working. I say very closely with the warden for years, and I continue to do so. Um, I don't know what the staff thought. You'd have to find out from some of them. Did, did they expect you to communicate with them um, about? Well, I did. Yes, or to some extent to represent them. Well, now there you are on to something. The warden reported to me that one of my colleagues, as a master, complained to him. I won't tell you who it was, because you know him. The, the, he complained that I ought to be the representative of the staff with the fellows. In pushing their interests, for example? I, that's, yes. That's right. And what I was, was the representative of the fellows to the staff. I never thought of myself as the representative of anybody to anything. I was, I was me. That's all. And um, it may have made uh, a slight breach between me and some of the rest of the staff. That I don't know. That you'd have to ask them. Yes. But it wasn't, it wasn't through any will of mine. If it did, that's all I can say. Were the fellows as a body, when you worked with them, they were all men then, were they um, fairly in touch with the college and what was going on? That's a difficult question to answer. I, I think I'd better not talk about the fellows. Right. The fellows always have been, I suppose, a very mixed bunch. There are, you get a few who are working hard. And uh, others who don't. No. Yes. Do, do you think as a, I'm speaking now as a, as a staff member, and I suppose we are very, very closely involved with everything that's going on day to day. And the fellows are a little bit maybe remote from us, apart from one or two that we might see frequently. Do, do you think, as, as someone who's worked with both bodies, staff and fellows, that, the, that what, what we might call the separation of powers is, is a good and valuable way of running a college like ours? I can't think of any other, that's all. Hmm. 
Um, I can't think of any other. Um, no. And the warden's role during all of our guys' time as chairman of the fellows, yeah. which is so well, his present uh, successor, um, Tim Macy, has changed. I, I know. Well, he, he didn't change it. It was the fellows changed it. And do you think it was a good change? No. Why? I don't think anything. I don't think anything has been gained by it at all. Uh, there was an idea arrangement for years by which the fellows had an executive committee which did really most of the work. Mm. And it elected its own chairman. See? Who was not the warden. Who was not the warden. I see. And the, the warden was in the chair for the full fellows meetings, which to a certain extent, I wouldn't like to say what they are now, I don't know, but up to five years ago when I resigned, <coughs> they were, they really did very little beyond rubber stamping what the executive committee had decided. And um, I never believed, and I, I put my case at the time, that I had resigned before they made that change. But I put my case in writing. I don't believe that the chairman is ipso facto endowed with extra powers or influence. It's there are only only one thing that really matters about a chairman. That is, is he a good chairman or a bad chairman? Yes. And that is a matter of luck. In my experience, yes. But it was during your period as a sub warden and indeed fellow of the college that girls were first admitted. I am. When was it first mooted, and what are your memories of it and of reactions to it among the fellows, among the staff? I remember it being mooted at a fellows meeting about a year before they were admitted. I think they were admitted. In 71. Yes. And it was in 70 it was first mooted. And it was one of the secrets which I think were well kept. See. What was the thinking behind it? Was it in order to build up numbers or was it for educational reasons? Well, I think that the motive was numbers. Fundamentally. I, I would say that. Uh, that made me sound cynical, but I, I think, I think it was, and it, I, it took us a year of deliberation. And you say it was a, a, a well kept secret. Right. Uh, kept from whom? The staff. Kept from everybody. Kept the fellows. Yes. Um, and were there strong arguments against it within the, the, the fellows? The only one I remember <laughs> was uh, a man who I loved very dearly, Owen Guinness, who said, this will happen over my dead body. <laughs> you know, well, unhappily, Owen died during that year, you see. So it was. I mean, I loved him. He was a lovely man, devoted to the place. He 
Charles's father. That's right. Yeah. I, he was a lovely man, but he was a um, conservative. Put it mildly, uh, and uh, I mean his instincts were conservative. And well, how, how did you and Ward Nargal um, react to the idea? when it was first put forward, and indeed in, in subsequent discussions. <coughs> I can't remember. I ought to remember. I don't know what he thought. It was always rather difficult to know what he did think about anything. And I can't remember what I thought, but probably we would try anything once, you know. You had two sons, or a guy that two sons, neither of you had daughters. Mm -hmm. did, did you find the thought of young women, teenage girls, about the place as, were, were they a very alien species? It was, um, you didn't know what was going to happen, you know. Well, we didn't know, but we were lucky. <laughs> How did the staff react to it? And, uh, oh, they were delighted. Them. Were they? I think the staff was all delighted. That was my impression. But um, the first four girls we had who came in 1971. How did you get them? I mean, was it generally, was it made known that St. Columbus was taking was, girls in the sixth form? I suppose so. One of them was the daughter of an old Columbus. Um, Jill Sheffield, and um, um, there was, um, what's her name, uh, um, Jillian Ruddock, who is now Jillian McCutcheon, and um, <coughs> that started there. Uh, and, well, okay, what was it like when they, when they arrived? It was much more marked the second year. Because there were more of them. More. Mm. Well, they went up to over a dozen, I think. I tell you what I thought was a good thing about having them there. It's a thing. There was a girl. If she by any chance, sees this. Oh, I can't help it. She was absolutely lovely. You see, she was quite beautiful. The boys were not, didn't run after. Well, now, I better not. I think I know why they didn't. She was very really ambitious. She wasn't interested. My elder son had left school by this time. And he came up to chapel one day, came to chapel, and he saw her, and he swelled up, you know, and my younger son, Peter, was a contemporary of hers. And uh, John, my other boy, said to Peter, why, why aren't you all off after her? And Peter's reply was, we well, get used to seeing the creature about the place. And I thought that was very really sound. See. Do you approve of um, the way, I suppose, what the, this experiment has now been extended to uh, make the college fully coeducational? Well, I didn't at the time. You felt they should have been just in the sixth form? Yes, yes. But so, I better not quote anybody else, but there was one time when among the fellows, there were two people 
were against taking the younger girls. And one was the warden, and the other was me, the two people who were schoolmasters. You see, they, but... Uh, Why were you against it, yourself? A pity. I think I thought they'd be difficult, the younger girls. Do you not think you were wrong? I don't know enough about it, you see. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I simply don't know. But I don't think the things that I was afraid of have happened, you see. I, at least I haven't been told of them happening. The, one of the implications, of course, was that there had to be a, a housemistress and that was yes. Mrs. Caird. And from, when I went to St. Columbus first, just after you'd retired, Mrs. Caird just came into the common room for a convention and left immediately I afterwards. Know. No women came into the common room, yeah. which now, to me, I 20 years on, seems an extraordinary thing. Was, did women just never enter the common room when you were there? Only the maids. <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember when we were being inspected by a woman whom I got to know well later. From the Department of Education. A fellow, Susan Parks. Oh, yes. I remember during one break, she came in, had a coffee or tea in the common. And I, I felt like, we all felt, I think, like a hen to have seen a fox. You know. <laughs> I'm not defending it, but that's what it was like. Yes. Rather like a woman coming into a male changing room. I do remember <laughs> before I lived, there was a. We certainly never had any women at dinner in the common room in the evening, you see. How many would there be at dinner in the common room in the evening, of, say, in the 60s? Might be up to ten, I suppose. Mm. But I remember one man who was not there now, I say, who brought his wife in, you see. Yeah. Well, he, he shouldn't tell. Did he just not know? Just didn't know. Yeah. And I had to speak to him about it. Really. How did he react? All right. Uh, you'd want to have known him. I don't think you did. No. But, uh, but uh, it's hard to know how he reacted to anything. But anyhow, she didn't come again. You see. But that was just ignorance. Um, and she wasn't a member of the staff. Mm. He didn't want to leave her at home, that's all. How did you feel um, on retirement in 1973? You were the guest that year at the St. Columbus Day. I was really sad. I was really sad. That's all. That's all I could say. And did that sadness lessen as the years went on? Oh, and yes. How long did it take? About six months. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you start working on the history? Well, there were two things I wanted to write in retirement. One was the little book, which was produced as the last word. And then I had thought that when I'd done that, I'd like to write the history of the college. And I <coughs> asked the Old Clubman Society if they would sanction it and support it, in fact. 
and um, they did Zim. And um, I really wanted to look up the dates. I must have started it about, I think it came out in 1980. It, A Labour of Love. Oh, yes. I worked at it for about four years. And okay. were, you, were you happy with the, as happy as the rest of us were with the, the finished? I was only pleased to love Miss Prince. Yes. That's true. I occasionally take it up to look up something. I was looking it up the other day uh, when writing about uh, Martin Argyle to remind me of things were done. In his time. Do, do you think that uh, as the, the historian of the college coming to the, the end of our, our discussion, we are this week in the middle of celebrations for our 150th anniversary. Do you think the founders would have been surprised that we lasted as long and do you think they'd be happy with what they would see today? No, quite certainly they'd be horrified. <laughs> what well, would horrify them? Girls, Catholics? Uh, both. Um, <laughs> the, I, the mention of Catholics reminds me of things that I don't know whether you've ever heard. I always feel a special relationship with you because my last term on the staff, the warden said to me, I have two applicants. One is a fairly well-qualified Protestant. The other is a very well-qualified Catholic. Which should I take? And without hesitation, I said, take the well, very well-qualified Catholic. That's why you're there. And that's the first time I heard that. Yeah. That's, that's the truth. He might have done without, without my encouragement, but he did. I gave it to him without hesitation. And <coughs> if I may say so, I have not re regretted it. Huh. There. But, um, and if, just to finish, your last word on this uh, recording, which will be seen by generations of Colombians to come. My last word. I think it's a college. I think uh, that old man, who, newspaper man, who lived in Dublin, used to come up to the college a lot. Now, what was his name? Um, he was to do with the Harmsworths. Cecil King. Cecil King. What he said to the warden after reading my book was that he was amazed at the college's Capacity for survival, you see. And uh, I think it, I think it will change as it has changed. And uh, sometimes for the better, not always for the better. But I think it has a great vitality see, of its own, that's all. That would be my last word. Mr. I White, think. thank you very much. Is that all?